What does the Bible say about our identity in Christ and why is it so important? These are the questions that I want to ponder with you today as we look at some different Bible verses about who we are in Christ. The Bible says that once we place our faith in Jesus, not only are we given the indwelling Holy Spirit, but we are also given a new identity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. If we want to walk according to this new character, it's important that we understand it. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We have been made new, which means that our lives should look different. The way we act, the way we think, the choices that we make, they should all be changed or look different than those who belong to the world. However, while we are still on earth, we still have to wrestle with this old nature. This old nature wages war against the new in an attempt to make us forget who we have been transformed into. Galatians 5 verse 17 says, For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you do not do the things that you please. So this is why we must continue to renew our minds with the truth of God's word. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. If you saw the movie Overcomer, which I totally recommend, it's awesome, you may remember when Principal Brooks or um, Priscilla Schreier asked the main character Hannah to read Ephesians chapters 1 and 2 and write down everything that the scripture said about who she is in Christ. So let's do something similar. Let's make our own identity in Christ list based on what we read in Ephesians chapter 1. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So there are four specific things or qualities that you and I need to recognize and remember from these verses. Number one, we are holy and blameless. Two, we are adopted as his children. Three, we are forgiven. And four, we are fellow heirs with Christ. Isn't that awesome? I am fully convinced that if we truly understand, believe, and apprehend what these verses are saying, our lives would look so much different. If we really believed that we are completely forgiven and blameless, and that he has made us to be his children, and that all that belongs to him is ours, and that we have an eternal inheritance waiting for us, one that will never spoil or fade, reserved in heaven, how would a true understanding of this alter the way that we live and the way that we think? And this is why knowing our identity is crucial to walking rightly with the Lord, because our choices start here in our minds and in our thoughts. What we think about our identity and about who we are will directly affect our actions and the choices that we make. And it's going to impact our relationships with others and with the Lord. So there are so many passages of scripture that speak of this new life that God has given us. So I want to go over a few more. And my challenge to you is don't just simply gain a theoretical knowledge of these verses, okay? Ask the Lord to show you how he would have you apply them to your life and then walk in the revelation that he gives you. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says that we have been made ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that we are a temple in which his spirit dwells. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 tell us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. John chapter 15 verse 15 says that Jesus has made us to be his friends. 
No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. First Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 said that we are part of the people of God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So perhaps you're like me. Maybe you struggle to realize and walk in your identity in Christ. Don't be discouraged because you are not alone. Ever since the garden, God's people have struggled to walk in their identity. And if you think about it, this was actually Eve's problem. She had an identity crisis, right? So instead of embracing the identity that God placed on her, she instead chose to listen to the lie that said she could become like God. We read in Genesis um, chapter 3, starting in verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Also, if we read through um, the first and second chapter of 1 Corinthians, you would see that this was a church of believers who struggled to continue to walk in their identity in Christ. They had divisions among them. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, they failed to mourn and um, remove the sin from among them. That was 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. They were yoking themselves together with unbelievers. That was 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. As I said earlier, what we believe about our identity is directly tied to our actions. So it's important for us to remember who we were before Christ and who we have now become because of Christ. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2 and then down to 4 and 5. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here are some more reasons why it's important for us to know our identity in Christ. First of all, knowing our identity in Christ helps us to love others. I love the story of Jesus sharing his last supper with his disciples. I'm always amazed by the example of humility that he gave them. In John chapter 13, starting in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from the Father and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments. And taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So not only did he leave an example of humility and servanthood for his disciples to follow, but did you notice what else motivated this action? We see in verse 3 that he understood and was confident in who he was. He knew that he had come from the Father and that he was going back. And he knew that all the resources of the Father belonged to him, that he would be returning to him. I believe this is the confidence that gave him that assurance that he needed to stoop down and take this position of humility. Our confidence in who we are as God's children gives us the abilities to love others according to God's word. Also, knowing our identity helps us persevere through trials. 1 Peter 1 verses 6 through 9 says, And this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Understanding who we are as his children helps us to persevere through the trials that we face in this world. Because we know that as his children, this world is only temporary, right? We have that future hope and that future glory to look forward to. And this is the hope that strengthens us and keeps us moving forward in faith. Also, knowing our identity in Christ helps us to battle in prayer. We are in a battle and this battle is spiritual. It's taking place within the heavenly places. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual 
spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Prayer is one of the greatest weapons we've been given in this battle to fight. Moving on down um, Ephesians um, chapter 6 to verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. With this in view, be on alert with the perseverance and petition for all the saints. Christ is seated in the heavenly places above all other rulers and authority and powers. It says that he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's right, my friend. You and I have been seated in a position of authority in Christ above all of our spiritual enemies. So when we engage in this battle, we fight from a place of victory because of who we are in him. So that's all I have for today. Share your thoughts with me below. Give this video a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. All this helps to get this video in front of others who are looking for this kind of content. Make sure to come join the Girls in the Word Bible Study group on Facebook. Subscribe to my email list and you'll get access to tons of free printables and Bible study resources. I'll leave the links to both of those in the description below. Thanks for watching.